Welcome to season two of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, November 18th, is National Injury Prevention Day. I speak to two experts in preventing serious and fatal injuries to children. One is Dr. Barbara Barlow, a professor of surgery and epidemiology at Columbia University and the founder of a coalition to prevent childhood injuries in Harlem 25 years ago. The other is Eileen McDonald, who directs the Injury Free Coalition in Baltimore. Let's listen. Thank you both so much for joining me today, November 18th, which is the National Injury Prevention Day. Dr. Barlow, I'll start with you. When did your work in injury prevention start? Oh, it started in the late 1980s when I went to Central Harlem and we had an injury rate that was twice the rate in the city and twice the rate in the country. Got it. And what were you doing then? I was head of pediatric surgery and the pediatric trauma service at Harlem Hospital in Central Harlem as a Columbia professor. And what were you seeing that made you think about injury prevention? I grew up in rural Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and I never saw anyone injured. So when I got there and I was seeing children falling out windows, which was 12% of the unintentional deaths of children, in New York City, and I saw children shot, stabbed, assaulted, hit by cars, falling in all sorts of dangerous play areas, I realized there must be a way to make the community safer for children and their families because the amount of injury we saw was overwhelming our hospital. And so uh, what did you do? You started a coalition? What we did is we started first with the School of Public Health doing a population-based injury surveillance system. So we had the data because we didn't want to do anything and then find out it didn't work. So we started a surveillance system. We built a coalition of hospital folks, parents, community organizations, elected officials, city officials, local foundations to help us with the funding and started working on making the community physically safer and safer for children in terms of having positive activities when they were out of school instead of negative street activities. And the mission was no more serious injuries for kids? The mission was to reduce major injuries that resulted in children being in the hospital and being permanently disabled or dying. And give me an example of how you did that. We worked with the schools and the Department of Health to do Children Can't Fly, where we require, the city then required the landlords to put up window guards. We worked with the schools to have Children Can't Fly days, where the children learn that it's not safe to, to lean out windows. And we work with the whole community to get it gated. And we decrease major in those window falls by 96%, I think it was in a year and a half or two years. It worked very well because the landlords would go to jail if someone fell out their building and didn't have guards. So what you're saying is it was partly understanding the risk in the community, partly educating individual children and families, but also partly getting the policies changed that could really prevent the injuries. Absolutely. Yes, because window gates are primary injury prevention. You have a window guard, you can't fall out, you can't be thrown out, you can't you can't go out the window. So it is primary prevention. So I'll turn to you, um, Eileen. You've worked in this area in, in Baltimore in a similar kind of uh, coalition. Tell me about what happens in Baltimore. Yes, I direct the um, Children's Safety Center at Johns Hopkins, and that has been an innovation that we've created at Hopkins to help make the safe behavior, the easiest behavior for families. Many people think that preventing childhood injuries is common sense, but that's 
kind of difficult when the information isn't really available. And many times the safety products and behaviors that are recommended are not available to families. So the idea behind the Children's Safety Center is to bring those things together in an easy place for families to access. So we've had great success in creating a safety center in one of our pediatric well-child clinics. And it's become part of what families expect to experience when they bring their children to well child care, that there will be a health educator available to talk to them about the injury risks that are relevant to their child's particular age and their family situation. If I'm a family uh, member and I go to the clinic, what do I leave with that might help me? It depends on who you are and what the age of your child or children is. If you are the dad of a new a new baby, we may ask you about your safe sleep behaviors. Where do you put your baby to sleep every night and during the day for naps? And if we learn from that interaction with you that you don't have a crib, a, the recommended safe sleep space for a baby, we will give you a portable crib. And then importantly, we'll talk with you about how to place your baby in that crib. You know about crib bumpers. You've helped to outlaw them in the state of Maryland, but that doesn't mean that that dad might get crib bumpers as a present from someone. So we educate you about the risks that would be in a sleep environment for your baby and how to avoid those things. What other kinds of things do you have available to give out to families? We have a variety of recommended safety products, things like bike helmets, stair gates, gauges to test your water temperature. Parents might not think about the importance of knowing how hot the water in their home can get. Um, We encourage them to test their water and make sure that when they are bathing their baby, there's not the chance of the water unintentionally scalding that child. We have things like cabinet latches and door latches to create safe environments to put things that you don't want your children to access behind those locked or latched places. Got it. You mentioned baby bumper pads. You don't give those out to you. We do not, but we educate parents about the risk of putting those unnecessary things in the baby sleep environment because of the risk that they confer. Right. So you tell people about dangerous products like bumper pads and you give people access to the safe products like stair guards or the bike helmets or other type thing. That's right. Got it. Now, how many programs are there like the one in Harlem and the one in Baltimore around the country? Dr. Barlow? Yes. We really have 45 programs. Now, some of them are stronger than others. We have 42 very strong programs, but we have other hospitals that are just coming on board and just starting. So we are dealing with 45 hospitals and schools of public health across the country. I'm going to ask you this question, Dr. Barlow. There there oftentimes isn't a strong push for prevention. You know, people are often responding, you know, to miraculous medical technologies and wanting to see those in their hospital. But the idea of um, lobbying or uh, mobilizing around events that haven't happened necessarily, all about prevention, that's more rare. How have you cracked the code to get people to really care about prevention? Many of our doctors who are principal investigators at our trauma centers, including myself, was a mem- were members of the Committee of Trauma of the College of Surgeons. They certify all the trauma centers in the country. And we had them write into the standards that the hospital must hire, in addition to a trauma nurse coordinator, an injury prevention coordinator who would use the data, address the community where the injuries were happening, do the whole program. And so it has become what you need to be verified as a trauma center. So that's how we encouraged it. And you're right. When I first started, people said, what are you doing? We don't. I had a head of a hospital tell me that I was emptying his beds because I was preventing injuries. How do you even respond to that? I said to him, you really want to see children injured injured and dying? And he said, well, they fill my beds. Now, that is not everyone's attitude. We have a lot of wonderful heads of hospitals who don't want to see children injured and who contribute to the program as well. But that was when I first started an attitude of some of the hospitals. 
Well, I, I appreciate what it means to have trauma surgeons on your side, though, and it sounds like you overcame those kinds of objections. And I didn't appreciate the 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 role that uh, surgeons have had in insisting that there be these prevention programs. And, and yes, it's very important because they can't get paid at the highest rate for trauma care unless they do the program that we have set up in Harlem all across the country. They need it to be verified as a level one trauma center. Um, Eileen, I want to ask you for a minute about the kinds of partnerships that the program in Baltimore has. I'm familiar with the fire department partnership. Could you tell a little bit about that? Yeah, we've had some great success working with the Baltimore City Fire Department in a number of ways. Um, From a research perspective, we've partnered with the fire department to go into homes with the fire department and not only evaluate the fire department's interaction when they educate families when they are installing a smoke alarm in their home, but also exploring the question of what additional benefit can you get when you bring another injury prevention professional alongside a fire department in these home visits when they're installing smoke alarms. So we not only help to strengthen the fire department's smoke alarm distribution program, but learn that families are willing to also learn about carbon monoxide alarm, hot water heater temperatures, and they did that in partnership with the fire department. We've also partnered with the fire department in bringing these kinds of prevention services into the community. We have a 40-foot tractor trailer that's outfit like a home. It's an educational experience where we can bring either groups of children or small groups of parents and children together, and we explore common elements in the home with an eye towards pointing out the injury hazard to them, and then most importantly, educating the parents, the adults, about the safety products that we have available and distributing those safety products right there through the mobile safety center. So the fire department does the big stuff like driving the truck, and we do the softer side of things of doing the education and outreach with families. Is it safe to ride in the back or you have to wait till you park the truck? (laughs) It's completely parked. We only ride when we are properly restrained in a seatbelt. All right. That was a trick question for you. Okay. (laughs) So um, November 18th, that when we're airing this, is the first National Injury Prevention Day. So what do you hope to accomplish, Dr. Barlow, with this day? We want to bring the attention of everyone to the fact that injuries can be prevented and they are a major cause of problems for children, also for adults. And we want to involve the whole community in taking seriously that we need to work together to prevent injury. Great. And Eileen, what are we going to see in some of these cities that are celebrating this day? Well, in Baltimore, you're going to see the Hopkins Dome and Baltimore City Hall lit in green, and that will be happening around the country. Um, Major landmarks in cities across the country will be lit in green. Green is the color of the coalition. But one of the strengths of this coalition model is that each coalition will be doing something different to respond to the injury problem in their community. Got it. What can individuals do to recognize this day? Well, we want everyone to work with our trauma centers and our Department of Health, Departments of Health and our Injury Control Research Centers to help them do the projects because there are not enough people in our hospitals or our schools of public health to do them. It takes a big coalition of people working together to spread the word, to pass out helmets, to have events in the community, and to do all the things we do. We work on every type of injury, both unintentional and intentional. Well, maybe we'll pick up some volunteers on this day too. Eileen? For your individual listeners, I'd also like to encourage them to um, join us for a Twitter chat at 1 p.m. today. We will be talking about a variety of pediatric injury issues and importantly about the solutions to them. So look for the hashtag be injury free. Great. Well, thank you all for joining me today and talking about how to prevent childhood injuries. Very exciting. They can be prevented. They were reduced 60% in Harlem and other of our sites, actually even uh, Cincinnati is reduced by 60%. And other sites have reduced between 20 and 40 percent. Great. Well, it's it's a really important effort and a great day 
for recognizing the work that you've done and so many people around the country are doing to keep kids healthy. Thank you. Thank you for your help. Thank you. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, Cian Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.